It is well known that there was a criminal underworld in the Victorian era, for it offered an escape from the poverty and drudgery of what was life for many. For respectable society, it was a dark and hidden world of which they knew little, until some intrepid people chose to explore this nefarious side of London. Who else would have known what a robber's den was like in the 1800s, and its shady characters, save the criminals themselves? Today, we travel back to 1860s London with an investigative journalist who, in disguise, dares to visit a hideout of thieves to discover the character of these criminals and witness their conversations. Find out if these low thieves of Victorian London were really dangerous, what kind of things they were stealing and why, and if our journalist leaves the den with the same opinion of them as the city's police that these villainous hangdogs deserved nothing but the full force of the law. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. The criminal who, in police nomenclature, is a low thief, to distinguish him it may be presumed from the respectable thief, is without exception of all men the most comfortless and miserable. And should the reader be so inquisitive as to desire to be informed of the grounds on which I arrive at this conclusion, I beg to assure him that I do not rely on hearsay. Neither do I depend on what thieves incarcerated for their offences have told me, holding it to be hardly likely that a prisoner in prison would vaunt his liking for crime and his eagerness to get back to it. I have mixed with thieves at liberty, an unsuspected spy in their camp, more than once. I will quote an example. This was many years since. It was at a thieves' raffle held at a public house in one of the lowest and worst parts of Westminster. I was young in the field of exploration then, and from all that I had heard and read made up my mind for something very terrible and desperate. I pictured to myself a band of rollicking desperados, swaggering and insolent, with plenty of money to pay for bottles of brandy and egg flip, a drink made with beer, egg and sweet spirits. Unlimited and plenty of bragging discourse of the doughty deeds of the past, and of their cold-blooded and desperate intentions for the future. Likewise, my expectations of hope and fear included a rich treat in the shape of vocalization. It was one thing to hear play actors on the stage, in their tame and feeble delineations of the ancient game of High Toby and of the redoubtable doings of the Knights of the Road, spout such soul-thrilling effusions as Nix My Dolly Pals and Claude Duval. But what must it be to listen to the same bold staves out of the mouths of real roaring boys, some of them possibly the descendants of the very heroes who rode up Hobon Hill in a cart? and who could not well hear the good words the attendant chaplain was uttering because of the noisy exchange of boisterous chaff taking place between the short pipe-smoking driver, whose cart-seat was the doomed man's coffin, and the gleeful mob that had made holiday to see the fun. But in all this I was dismally disappointed. I had procured a ticket for the raffle from a friendly police inspector, Goodness only knows how he came possessed of them, but he had quite a collection of similar tickets in his pocket-book. And, disguised for the occasion, I entered the dirty little dram-shop and exhibited my credential to the landlord at the bar. So far the business was promising. The said landlord was ill-looking, a villain as could be desired. He had a broken nose and a wooden leg both of which deformities were doubtless symptomatic of the furious brawls in which he occasionally engaged with his ugly customers. As I entered, he was engaged in low-whispered discourse with three ruffians who might have been brothers of his in a similar way of business, but bankrupt and gone to the dogs. As I advanced to the bar, the four cropped heads laid together in iniquity, 
separated suddenly, and the landlord affected a look of innocence and hummed a harmless tune in a way that was quite melodramatic. I intimated my business, and he replied shortly, Go on through, at the same time indicating the back door by a jerk of his thumb over his shoulder. Now for it. On the other side of the back door I discovered a stone yard, at the extremity of which was dimly visible in the darkness a long, low, dilapidated building, with a light shining through the chinks. This, then, was the robber's den, a place to which desperate men and women who made robbery and outrage the nightly business of their lives resorted to squander in riot and debauchery their ill-gotten gains. It would not have surprised me had I found the doorkeeper armed with a pair of trusty barkers and every male guest of the company with a life-preserver, a club-like weapon, sticking out of the breast pocket of his coat. The door was opened in response to my tap at it. I gave the potman there stationed my ticket, and I entered. I must confess that my first sensation as I cast my eye carelessly around was one of disgust that I should have been induced to screw up my courage with so much pains for so small an occasion. The building I found myself in was a skittle ground, furnished with forms and tables, and there were present about thirty persons, as well as I can remember. Of this number a third were women, young generally, one or two being mere girls of sixteen or so. But Jenny Diver was not there, nor Paul Maggot, nor Edgeworth Bess, no lady with ringlets curling over her alabaster shoulders found a seat on the knee of the gallant spark of her choice. No Captain Macheath, a fictional eighteenth-century cut-throat, was to be seen elegantly taking snuff out of a stolen diamond snuff-box, or flinging into the pink satin lap of his lady-love a handful of guineas to pay for more brandy. Poor wretches! The female shoulders there assembled spoke rather of bone than alabaster, while the washed-out and mended cotton frock served in place of pink satin, and hair of most humble fashion surmounted faces by no means expressive either of genuine jollity or even of a desperate determination towards devil may careness and the drowning of care in the bowl. There were no bowls, even as in the good old time, only vulgar pewter porter pots, out of which the company thankfully swigged its fourpenny. There was no appearance of hilarity, or joviality, even. No more of brag and nourish, or of affectation of case and freedom, than though every man and woman present were here locked up, on remand, and any moment might be called out to face that damning piece of kept-back evidence they all along dreaded was in store for them. To be sure, it was as yet early in the evening, and though the company may have assembled mainly for the purpose of drowning dull care, that malicious imp, being but recently immersed, may have been superior at present to their machinations, and able to keep his ugly head above the liquid poured out for his destruction. Or, maybe, again, being a very powerful dull care of sturdy and mature growth, he might be able to hold out through many hours against the weak and watery elements brought to oppose him. Anyhow, so far as I was able to observe, there was no foreshadowing of the blue and brooding imp's defeat. His baneful wings seemed spread from one end of the skittle alley to the other, and to embrace even the chairman, who being merely a receiver of stolen goods, might reasonably have been supposed to be less susceptible than the rest. There would seem to prevail, amongst a large and innocent section of the community, a belief that the thief is a creature distinguished no less by appearance than by character from the honest host he thrives by. I have heard it remarked more than once, by persons whose curiosity has led them to a criminal court, when a trial of more than ordinary interest is proceeding, that really this prisoner or that did not look like a thief, or a forger, or stabber, as the case might be. Lord bless us! I once heard an elderly lady exclaim, in the case of an oft-convicted scoundrel of the swell-mob tribe, over whose affecting trial she had shed many tears. 
Lord bless us, said she, as the jury found him guilty and sentenced him to two years' hard labour. So thin and genteel, and with spectacles on too. I declare I should have passed that young man twenty times without dreaming of calling out for the police. On the other hand, there are many persons less ingenuous than the old lady, who invariably regard a man through the atmosphere of crime, real or supposed, that envelopes him, and, by means of its distorting influence, make out such a villain as satisfies their sagacity. Had one of this last order been favoured with a private view of the company assembled to assist at Mr. Mullins' raffle, and have been previously informed that they were one and all thieves, in all probability they would have appeared thieves. But I am convinced that had they been shown to an unprepared and unprejudiced observer, his opinion would have been that the company gathered in the skittle alley of the curly badger were no worse than a poor set of out-o'-work tailors, or French polishers, or weavers, or of some other craft, the members of which affect the gentility that black clothes and a tall hat is supposed to confer on the wearer. Nor would an hour in their society, such as I spent, have sufficed to dissipate the innocent impression. Their expenditure was of the most modest sort, not one man in six venturing beyond the pot of beer. Their conversation, though not the most elegant, was least of all concerning the wretched trade they followed. Indeed, the subject was never mentioned at all, except in melancholy allusion to Peter or Jerry, who had been recently copped, taken, and was expected to pass a tailpiece in the steel, three months in prison. There was one observation solemnly addressed by one elderly man to another elderly man, the purport of which at the time puzzled me not a little. Unlucky! Well, you may say it, Black Maria is the only one that's doing a trade now. Every journey full as a tuppenny omnibus. I listened intently, as prudence would permit, for further reference to the mysterious female who was doing all the trade, and every journey was as full as a tuppenny omnibus. But nothing in the conversation transpired, tending to throw a light on the dark lady. So I mentally made a note of it for reference to my friend, the inspector. He laughed. Well, she has been doing a brisk stroke of business of late, I must say, said he. Black Maria, sir, is our van of that colour that carries them off to serve their time. But, as before observed, there was nothing in the demeanour of either the men or women present at Holland's raffle to denote either that they revelled in the nefarious trade they followed, or that they derived even ordinary comfort and satisfaction from it. To be sure, it may have happened that the specimens of the thief class assembled before me were not of the briskest, but taking them as they were, and bearing in mind the spiritless, hang-dog, mean and shabby set they were, the notion of bringing to bear on them such tremendous engines of repression as that suggested by the humane commissioner of the city police appears nothing short of ridiculous. At the same time, I would have it plainly understood that my pity for the thief of this class by no means induces me to advise that no more effective means than those which at present exist should be adopted for his abolition. A people's respect for the laws of the country is its chief pillar of strength, and those who have no respect for the laws act as so many rats undermining the said pillar and although the rats assembled at Mullins' raffle were not of a very formidable breed, their hatred of the law and their malicious defiance of it was unmistakable. For instance, the article to be raffled was a silk pocket handkerchief, and there it was duly displayed hanging across a beam at the end of the skittle ground. The occasion of the raffle was that Mr. Mullins had just been released after four months' imprisonment, and that during his compulsory absence from home matters had gone very bad, and none the less so because poor Mrs. Mullins was suffering from consumption. In alluding to these sad details of his misfortune, Mr. Mullins, in returning thanks for the charity bestowed on him, looked at the picture of melancholy. Whether she means ever to get on her legs again is more than I can say said he, wagging his short-cropped head dolefully. There ain't much chance, I reckon, when you're discharged from Brompton incurable. Yes, my friends, it's all again me lately, and my luck's regular out. But there's one thing I must mention. And here he lifted his head with cheerful satisfaction. 
beaming in his eyes. And I'm sure you as doesn't know it will be very glad to hear it. The handkerchief what's put up to raffle here is the very identical one that I was put away for. And judging from the hearty applause that followed this announcement, there can be no doubt that Mr. Mullen's audience were very glad indeed to hear it. But even after this stimulant, the spirits of the company did not rally anything to speak of. Song singing was started, but nobody sung. Nix my dolly pals, or Claude Duval. Nobody raised a roaring chant in honour of ruby wine, or the flowing bowl, or even of the more humble, though no less genial, foaming can. There was a comic song or two, but the ditties in favour were those that had a deeply sentimental, or even a funereal smack about them. The gentleman who had enlightened me as to Black Mariah sang The Sexton, the chorus to which lively stave, I'll provide you such a lodging as you never had before, was taken up with much heartiness by all present. Mullins himself, who possessed a fair alto voice, slightly damaged perhaps by a four-month sojourn in the bleak atmosphere of cold bath fields, sang My Pretty Jane, and a very odd sight it was to observe that dogged, jail-stamped countenance of his set, as accurately as Mullins could set it, to an expression matching the bewitching simplicity of the words of the song. I was glad to observe that his endeavours were appreciated, and an encore demanded. Decidedly, the songs, taken as a whole, that the thieves sang that evening in the skittle saloon of the Curly Badger, were much less objectionable than those that may be heard any evening at any of our London music halls. And everything was quiet and orderly. Of course I cannot say to what extent this may have been due to certain rules and regulations enforced by the determined-looking gentleman who served behind the bar. There was one thing, however, that he could not enforce, and that was the kindliness that had induced them to meet together that evening. I had before heard, as everybody has, of honour amongst thieves— but I must confess that I had never suspected that compassion and charity were amongst the links that bound them together. And when I heard the statement from the chair of the amount subscribed, the raffle was a matter of form, and the silk handkerchief a mere delicate concealment of the free gift of shillings. When I heard the amount, and looked round, and reckoned how much a head that might amount to, and further, when I made observation of the pinched and poverty-stricken aspect of the owners of the said heads, I am ashamed almost to confess that if within the next few days I had caught an investigating hand in my coat-tail pockets, I should scarcely have had the heart to resist.' 